Well, what I'd like to do now is uh, walk through uh, some upgrades that you and I have experienced. Now, some of you have been on here for a long time, have seen this. Uh, it's been updated a little bit, probably since you've seen it. But we have quite a few new people with us and some who are just guests today, visitors. And so you're all welcome. Everybody's welcome. There's no... That's, it's wonderful to have you on board. But uh, I'd like to walk through this a little bit. I'm going to share screen and talk through. Here's the dynamic that I want to uh, focus on today. Let's say you and I got an issue, a problem, uh, something that needs some attention. And uh, we, as believers, we uh, want to do something about it. Uh, we talked about, uh, who was it, Katie, a while ago, integrating into the scenery, into the picture, and changing the picture. How about that? We heard Michael a while ago traveling somewhere and depositing his peace. We heard about Sherry a while ago expanding her spirit over someone. And I'm sure we mentioned other things today also. But I'm going to mention those and others that God is expanding our toolage. I don't know if that's a word. Our equipping. He's giving us more equipment to work with. And uh, so whereas in the past, back in the church age, which the church age I think is pretty much phasing down, and the kingdom age is ramping up. We're somewhere in that crossover transitionary part of that transition. But anyway, uh, in the church age, we saw ourselves primarily as plaintiffs. Plaintiffs. We hoped to get God's attention enough that he would notice my need and touch me at the point of my felt need. And so that was good. It did great. That's what we do for babies all the time. When babies cry and dirty their diaper, we take care of them. And there's no fault whatsoever. But when we grow up, there's a different way. Okay, I'm going to share screen. We're going to talk through acquiring new tools. So, we're going to grow in our authority and in our effectiveness. The question is, so what options do I have to impact the issues in my world? In the past, we only knew of or used one main tool. What was that? Our petition tool. This included supplication and treaties and a lot of plaintiff. Kind of like the widow in Luke 18, the widow and the unjust judge. But by definition, this posture puts God at a distance from us. It reflects a potentially tenuous relationship, meaning... I'm not really secure in love here. I'm not sure if you notice me. I'm not sure if you'd want to help me. And by the way, you're a long ways away and you probably can't hear me, so let me bang on your door. You see, right now, with what you and I are experiencing, that actually hurts my heart. I mean, I feel sad in my heart to think that that's how we perceived God. We now have proceeded, progressed miles beyond that. We know we have a good father. And this father is filled with a heart of delight like we were experiencing today that washes our hearts and we know we are confident in love. But we know better now and we're steadily gaining new operating tools that reflect the upgraded revelation we have of who we are in his eyes. So here's an overview of tools, at least what we know at this time. I had to leave a little caveat in there because <laughs> this, this list grows. This list, list is in the, in the expansion mode. <laughs> well, our number one, our first one that we've always known in the past was petition, supplication. We use the word, let's cry out, or plaintiff, sadly, it was beggar style. This is how we start out with God. And I try to give a passage, a reference for each one of those. And by the way, uh, I will include this document in our next email. Well, along came Holy Spirit and we realized we could pray in tongues. 
In other words, we could partner with Holy Spirit, and when we pray in tongues, we pray mysteries to God. And He prays with us, uh, through us with groanings, too deep for words when we don't know how to pray. Wow, okay, it's not just up to little old earthling me. It's not just plaintiff me anymore. I got Holy Spirit. This is cool. Well, then we realized we could go into the situation and look around and see where Jesus was. What's Jesus doing in this situation? Kind of sozo style. Number four. Then we heard a verse. Most translations don't get it right. They say have the faith, uh, have the uh, have faith in God. But the literal translation of this verse, Jesus said it, so it's out of his mouth. He said, have the faith of God. Well, you and I know we can't, we're can't. we not going to conjure it up by sweating or grunting. I think maybe it relates to Jesus when he said, uh, except you become like a little child. And little children just believe. Can I jump off this cliff, Daddy? Yep, you can. Okay, Daddy. And Daddy catches you. Now, assuming that you've really heard Daddy's voice, Daddy will always catch you. Now, if you're presuming that you've heard his voice and assuming, then that's a completely different story and we might get some egg on our face. But if we've really heard, it's just like, okay, Jesus, I don't know how to do this. Father, I don't know how this is going to get done, but I'm just going to have faith. The faith that you are good and whatever you say is going to get done. Number five, we see and hear prophetically and we prophesy into somebody's situation. Prophesy just, uh, I see the Lord doing this and see the Lord doing that. Or how about number six, informed intercession. Now this is kind of like number five, but here we've gone into the heavenlies. We've seen a thing seen it the way Father sees it, and after we hear what he says, from the heavenly places, we begin to declare and decree as oracles of God. That's First Peter. Number seven. Sherry talked about this. We expand our spirits over the situation, and we bring it in under our spirit. Whatever that situation is, we bring you in. We hover over. It's kind of like Genesis 1 the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. Number eight, we can travel in the Spirit to the location. Michael told us a story about that today. Travel in the Spirit. Well, at first we think we got to pedal our bike all the way down. That's a long ways. I might get wore out. Or, <laughs> or <laughs> we find out, wait a minute, there's no time or distance in the Spirit realm. What am I doing pedaling my bike? <laughs> Oh, it's all fun stuff as we're growing up, isn't it? <laughs> but uh, there's a couple of passages that <clears throat> give uh, uh, precedence for that in Scripture. Number nine, we time travel to redeem the past or set things in place in the future. Uh, the Bible talks about redeeming the time. And I, I'm going to stop here just a second. About three weeks ago, Debbie and I were out in Denver, Colorado, and on our way home, it was night, uh, getting past dark, and we were going to stop someplace to get something to eat with our two grandsons in the back seat. And uh, so we found a spot in a city ahead of us. We were searching Google, and okay, like that. I looked on this road sign, and it said 16 miles. Now, I know it said 16 miles. But about three or four minutes later, Debbie said uh, her uh, Google Maps said, we're going to turn it off, be turning off in about a mile and a half. We both looked at each other. I said, Deb, that sign back there said 16 minutes, and we've only gone three to five minutes, and now it says we've only got a minute or a mile and a half to turn off. And we both looked at each other and said, huh, I wonder if we traveled in time. Well, I tell you what, I'm going to be like a little child, and I'm just going to believe it and begin uh, putting those events, those experiences, like building blocks in my building of faith, in my position of faith. And so uh, you got to start somewhere. Despise not the day of small beginnings. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Number 10, 
release or commission appropriate angels into the situation. Now that's a story I'm going to tell after this. Number 11, we meet corporately in the heavenlies and there we hear the Lord's plan. A oh, really good one for that is uh, Exodus 24 where Moses and the 72 elders or whatever they were uh, had the first corporate ascension. Yes, it's in the Bible. <laughs> and then Hebrews 12 says all of us together have come to this Mount Zion. And uh, oh, we could go off, get on tangent on every one of these. Number 12. We can engage with saints who've gone on so that we get perfected together. That's Hebrews 11.40. God is, uh, I believe it's in his heart for us to do things together so that we be perfected together. In other words, doing the process, doing the project, doing the progression together and coming into maturity. Number 13. Translate physically to the location to fulfill a mission. Now, most of us here have heard of the accounts of the Ladies of Gold uh, intercession group in California back in the middle 1900s. and So they set a modern-day example, but look at John 20 and Acts 20. Number 14, we personally become a sign and a wonder. Now, remember, the reason we're citing these, let me go back to the beginning just a second, is we're looking at the expanded tools that God is giving us to affect our world. So, how would we affect the world by becoming a sign and wonder? Well, look what Isaiah 60 says. You, you, arise, shine, and for your light is coming, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Well, how's that going to affect the world? Okay, go to verse 3. It says, When the world, when the kings of the nations see you rising and shining, it says they will come to the brightness of your rising. Huh. You mean I could affect things without having to pray, prophesy, go anywhere? All I got to do is wear the glory of God. Yep. That's what that passage says. You, it says you will affect the world around you. It will affect the kings of the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and I like to say that this is not talking about an ethereal kind of inner beauty, inner glory that only the Lord sees or maybe those with special eyes. No. The kings, the secular, carnal, heathen kings of the world don't see this ethereal kind of inner glory thing. There's something visible upon the people such that it makes them leave their nations. And it says not only do they leave their nations, but they bring their camels and their sons and their daughters and their gold, and they come to you. I'm telling you, I think this might be one of our best tools yet. Just go ahead and get lit up. <laughs> Just get lit up. Number 15, laying on of hands. Level one is physically. We believe in the laying on of hands. Number two is in the spirit. You go somewhere and you lay hands on them and impart. Number 16, draw water from the river of God within us and then give it away. Uh, some of us have seen Bob Jones. He says, let me show you how to do it. You dip into your belly where the rivers of water flow out living water, you scoop it up and you give it away. And of course, there are several passages to verify or put more credibility on that concept. Number 17, be a co-creator with God. Romans 4, call forth those things which are not, are not as though they were. Now, none of us do that in and of our own soul. We don't do this by our own self. Not out of ourself. We have to abide in the vine and we have to hear first. God, is that what you want to do? Really? Are you sure? Okay, God, if that's what you want to do, I'm going to call it forth. It never has been for, it never has been uh, manifest on the earth ever before. But because I've heard you say it, I'm going to call it forth. Number 18. Via light from our spirit, we convey virtue 
and heavenly commerce. Now that's kind of a new one. That's one that we've been experimenting with a little bit. Is communicating or transferring, transmitting with light. I believe it's quite it's a good possibility that uh, our heavenly order of communication will probably not be so much in decibels and syllables, but via light from our spirit. Jesus said, first of all, that he is the light of the world, and then he turned it around and said, now you are the light of the world. And 1 John says, if we walk in the light as he is then the light, we have fellowship one with another. So, uh, I think we're going to, uh, not to too distant future, we're going to have more and more experiences of finding light to be the medium or the vehicle that transfers uh, the commerce of communication. A couple little paragraphs. As we mature, and as Father deems it timely, these tools are granted to us. In other words, we didn't get number 18 back when we were a baby. We're having to grow into these tools, grow into the timeliness for these tools, to the fittedness, the appropriateness of these tools. Each additional tool requires another one, level of maturity, number two, greater devotion to Jesus, and number three, greater character to keep us from misuse of the tool. Because each successive tool brings with it increasingly more liberty, more authority, and more power. Do you remember Bill Johnson said, speaking about these things gives people more permission or possibility to enter into weirdness. But what are we going to do? Jesus decided to put treasures in earthen vessels. Now he did say there were some things I can't tell you yet. But then based on maturity levels, he begins to open things up. So what we're talking about today is not for babes. There does have to be the appropriateness of maturity to warrant the ability to wear these tools, to utilize and function in these tools, yea, even use them with authority and power. Last paragraph. These are just for starters. Remember I said this is a, start, uh, a list that's in expansion mode. <laughs> These are just for starters to inspire us into an eternity of new territories and tools being opened up to us. Let's say it together. There will never, ever be a reason to be bored again. <laughs> if you don't mind, let's just say it together. There will never, ever be a reason to be bored again. 